what God can do. Amen. No limit what he can do. Hallelujah. Amen. He said he can do exceedingly abundantly more. We could even ask or think. Amen. Amen. We're talking about God. Amen. We're not talking about a friend. Amen. We're not talking about one in the flesh, but we're talking about the Holy One. We're talking about our Father. Amen. Who created the heavens and earth. that we can make our petition known, our request known to the Lord with prayer and thanksgiving because of the finished work that Jesus did on Calvary's cross. Amen. Won't you stand all around? Amen. We're going to pray and ask the Lord, amen, that he would have his way. Amen. Amen. As we open up the bread of life. Amen. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you by in the name of Jesus, the Christ, the Anointed One, our Savior, O oh God, our Ransom Lamb, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God. We come with thanksgiving, O oh God, because we know that all that Jesus has done is available for us, O oh God, that we can be the beneficiaries. And now, O oh God, as we break open the bread of life. God, I ask, oh God, that you would forgive me, oh God, of all of my sins, oh God. For God, I declare, oh God, and acknowledge, oh God, that without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, that I'm not worthy, oh God. I'm not worthy, God, I'm not worthy to preach nor teach your word. But I thank you, God, that you look beyond my faults. You allow mercy and grace to suit my case. And you chose me in spite of myself. And now, oh God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you be the teacher. You said the Holy Spirit will teach us and lead us and guide us into all truth. Lord, if there's anything, oh God, in any spirit, oh God, that is in this place, oh God, that's not of you, we ask, oh God, that you would put it under arrest, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God, that you would bind it up. In the name of Jesus, that there will be no hindrance, oh God, and that your people shall be able to hear and receive your word, oh God, and that it will do a new thing in their life, God. And for this we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. There will be several scriptures that we are going to be looking at on today. You know, many times in the Bible, whether it was in the temple, or on a boat, or on the mountain, and even sometimes in someone else's house, Jesus did not preach. But he took the time to teach. That's right, that's right. He took the time to teach. This morning, we're going to look at some scripture, amen? There's gonna be no preaching on this morning, amen? But there is going to be some teaching because there are some things that are just too valuable to miss. There are some things that's a matter of life and death that we need to know and that we need to understand and that we need to correct because our life, our salvation, and eternal life depend on us knowing these things, amen? There are so many things that we do in ignorance, amen, or we do out of tradition, or we do in ritual, by ritual, that we really don't understand what we're doing, amen? But today we're going to take a close look at God's word. Today, Pastor asked if I would talk about two things, and these are two, somebody say holy, holy. ordinances, holy. that Jesus, Jesus, Jesus commanded that we obey, amen? And this is for every believer, every born-again person, everybody who has received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And Jesus gave these commands before he even ascended into the heavens, amen? The first one was the holy baptism, and the second is holy communion. Now on today, we're going to take a look at <clears throat> these two uh, articles that Jesus 
establish and instituted, amen, for the believer. The first thing we're going to look at is the baptism. Amen. And when we think of baptism, there are some frequently asked questions that you have maybe been asking yourself. And that is, should a baby be baptized? Can you get baptized more than once? Is it okay just to be sprinkled? Do you have to be baptized to be saved? Why should believers be baptized? Why did Jesus get baptized since he did not sin? And how old do you have to be to be baptized? The goal for today is to answer these questions. Not according to doctrine, not according to bylaws, but according to the scripture, according to the scripture, amen? So we're going to take a look at the scripture. The word baptism in and of itself means to be dipped, to be merged, to be plunged, and to be completely covered. In other words, going completely under, amen? is what the word baptiz baptism means. When you get baptized, it is an outward sign or symbol to an inwardly change. In other words, the change happens in the inside first. And once that is happening in the inside and you have received Jesus Christ as your personal savior, then you're representing to the world. You're making a proclamation. You're making an announcement. You're letting it be known that some things have happened in your life. Amen. One, that you have confessed that you have sinned. Yes. Amen. How many of you know that we all have sinned yes. and fallen short of the glory of God? Amen. Yes. So we don't need to trick our, ourselves. Amen. The Bible declares if we say that we have not sinned, that we are a liar and that the truth is not in us. Not only do we confess our sins, but we repent. It's all okay to say, I'm guilty. Yeah, I did it. But the question is, now that you have done it, what is the condition of your heart? What is your attitude? How do you feel about it? And God said we need to be godly sorrowful. We need to be sorry that we did it. Not sorry that we got caught, but sorry that we did it. With a mind to say, Lord, help me, because this is something I don't ever want to do again. I don't ever want to find myself in this place again. So when you're representing to the world, you're saying, I've confessed that I'm a sinner, that I have sinned. I have repented. And I believe in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. And I have been forgiven. How many know that you got to realize that you have been forgiven? Jesus said that he would what? Wash us, amen, of all of our unrighteousness, amen. He said he would remove our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. And he would bring it up no more. So we got to realize we need to confess sin. We need to repent of sin. We need to know that we have been forgiven and we've been washed in the blood. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then we need to know that when we, got, when we get baptized, that we die with Christ. Amen? And when he raises us up, we're walking in the newness of life. Well, amen. You might say, how, I, how do I know that's true? Turn to Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> Book of Romans, the 6th chapter, verses 3 and 4. Are you there? Or are you still turning? Amen. Well, keep on turning, amen, because it's important that you see the word for yourself. Amen? Romans 6. So again, that's Romans the 6th chapter, verses 3 and 4. Amen? Mm -hmm. And it says as follows in the King James Version. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into death. Therefore we are buried with him by the baptism into death, 
that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Once we are baptized, we should walk in the newness of life. Amen? And so as we look at this scripture, it says that we were, <clears throat> amen, baptized with Christ, amen, we were buried and risen again. I would use, for example, I need a child. Amen. They're all back there. Um, anyone will do. Amen. Sophie, come on. Oh, Nigel. Come on, Nigel. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We'll notice in the scripture that it says that we're going to be buried. So, you know, can a teaspoon of water bury you? No. Can a little sprinkle of water bury you? No. Amen. And so what happens, we find out that when we come to Jesus, this is what the baptism represents. It represents that when we come, we realize that we are a sinner. We realize that we need a Savior. We realize that our Savior is Jesus Christ. Amen. And then we're confessing our sins. Amen. We're telling God we're sorry. Amen. And we want to receive the gift of eternal life, amen, by receiving Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And then the Bible tells us that all those old things are passed away. And behold, all things become new. So Dick, can you come here for one moment, please? So as he holds the mic, when we come, amen, this is a simple uh, symbol of what has already happened to us once we made that confession. The baptism represents the fact that we came Jesus. Filled with sin. Amen? Amen? But when Jesus forgave us, he took our sin. Hold your nose. Have you been baptized already? Okay, hold your nose. I'll show you what's going to happen. They do that one get in the water. That's the physical part. But what happens is then the person is dunked completely. I got you, baby. And Jesus got up completely down in the water. Everything old about him is being there. Right. It's been cut under the water. Amen. It's been washed away. It's been covered with the blood. Yes. So when he comes up, hallelujah, it represents that he is the new person. Yes. Right. He got a new start. The slate has been cleaned, amen, and he's able to run on, amen, for his life. That's what happens to us, amen? amen. So what has happened is when we come, we're telling the world a wonderful change has come over me. Amen? And the Bible says that we should not be ashamed. He said, if we're ashamed of God, then he what? He will be ashamed of us. So we're making an open, public confession. Some of you, when you get married, you can't wait to have a big old wedding. Because you want everybody to know that you found the love of your life. You want everybody to know that you're making a commitment for the rest of your life. And so you're putting it on display. And so Jesus is saying, this is what I want you to do. When you receive me, I don't want you to be ashamed. I want you to let the world know. I want you to put it on display. Let them know that you have now made a commitment to me. Because I've already made a commitment to you. Let them know that you have found the love of your life. How many know Jesus is a lover like Noah? Amen. Amen. And we can see the baptism being demonstrated in Matthew, the third chapter. Turn with me to Matthew, the third chapter. And we're going to see in this demonstration, it's going to be John the Baptist that's going to be doing the baptizing. Amen? Amen. So if we look at Matthew, the third chapter, verses 1 through 6, we're going to see that John the Baptist is preaching one message. I tell you, if you got one message, and it's the message God gave you, it's enough. Amen? Amen? And so John had one message, and he stuck to that message. Amen? And it brought about great results. So if we look in Matthew, <clears throat> the third chapter, beginning with the first through the sixth verse, it says this. Are we there? Yes. In those days, John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, repent. Repent means to what? Not just confess your sins, but turn from them and be godly sorrowful that you committed it. 
He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, this voice of one, this is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Amen? And it says, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his way straight. In that same John and his raiment of camels here, and leather girdle about his, about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then he went out to Jerusalem and all Judea, and the regions round about the Jordan, and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So we see that before he baptized them, what did they have to do? They had to confess their sins. They had to repent. Notice that John went out and preached the word, amen? He went out and gave the message. And after he gave the message of what God told him to do, we found out that it brought about good results because the people heard and they responded to the message, amen? That's right, that's right. <clears throat> As we look at verse 11 in this very same chapter, amen, we're going to see John the Baptist telling the people who he and who Jesus is. Amen. The difference of his baptism and the difference of the baptism of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And in this 11th verse, John the Baptist, amen, declares, he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me, who is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then as shortly after he says that, we go on and we see verse number 13 mm -hmm. through 17. But in these verses, John is letting him know that I'm baptized. This is a water baptism this is, that I'm doing. This is as far as I can go. I can let you know what sin is. I can let you know that you need to be forgiven of sin. But then Jesus is going to take it a little further. Somebody said Jesus had to take it further. Jesus had to Amen. Take it further. He had to take it further by actually giving his life. Amen? Amen. As a ransom for us. And so then we could be baptized once he ascended to the heaven. We could be baptized with the Holy Ghost, which is the keeping power. We could be baptized with the fire that sits us on fire, that consecrates us, that, that um, sanctifies us. Amen? and makes us uh, the anointing on our life so great that we can be effective in the world, amen? amen? And so we see that here, John understands his role and he understands Jesus' role. And it's important to him that the people understand as well, amen? And so he lets them know, I'm not worthy even to be compared with Jesus, amen? I'm doing my job, but it doesn't compare to Jesus. We see in verses 13 through 17, which is key, amen? You there? Yeah. Amen. It says this. Then came Jesus from Galilee to the Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon them. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son of whom I'm well pleased. Man, so we find out here that Jesus comes to John That's right. to be baptized. And John says, oh no, uh-uh, this should be the other way around. You want me to baptize you, but I need you to baptize me. I recognize who you are. You are the Messiah. You are the Savior of the world. And Jesus said, let it be so, so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. In other words, Jesus was saying, John, this has to be done, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was baptized even though he knew no sin. 
Even though he had never sinned, he was baptized. One, he set the example for us. We see what the baptism is like. Was it a sprinkle? No. No, amen. But he was completely emerged in the water. Since when he come up out of the water, amen. I mean, he was covered and had to come all the way up out of it. So he did it so the scripture might be fulfilled. He did to sit example for us. Amen. <clears throat> and he did <clears throat> it also. There's another reason. Let me see where it is. He did it so the scripture might be fulfilled. He did it to set an example uh, for us. And the next one will come to my mind in a minute. Amen. We just thank God that he did it. Amen. 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 So he did it to so an example for us and so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Amen. And he also did it to give us a hope. A hope. Amen. That's a a hope. Go. Amen. Amen. For glory. Jesus gives the command of baptism in Matthew 28th chapter verses 19 through 20. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, the 28th chapter. These are scriptures you can simply write down and then later go back and read them for yourself. Amen? Amen. 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 And this is the 28th chapter, verses 19 through 20, and it reads as follows. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We'll find that this is known as the Great Commission, amen? Right. That Jesus had given to his disciples. Notice the order in which it is listed. First it says go, amen? That's right. A messenger has to be willing to go to carry the message. Then it says, teach all nations. In other words, before anybody can be baptized, they have to be taught. They have to be taught. So it says, go and teach all nations. Let them know all nations that salvation is for all mankind. Jesus died that none would have to pierce and that we all could have eternal life. So he tells them to go, <clears throat> And he tells them to teach all nations. And then after you teach them, he says, then baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so we see that this being demonstrated as an example in Acts 8, 35 through 38. If you want to turn your Bible to that scripture, you can. It's Acts, the 8th chapter, verses 35 through 38. And we're going to see in this illustration that Philip, amen, is on his way and God redirects him. God ever redirect you? You think you're going one place and the Holy Spirit speaks to you and tells you, no, I want you to go this way instead. Well, what had happened is shortly after Stephen had been stoned to death yeah. and the disciples had to scatter and leave, amen, we find out that Philip was on his way, going somewhere. The Lord said, no, I want you to go in this direction, amen. amen? And the Lord leads him to another direction. And when he gets there, he meets a man, amen? Somebody say, he meets a man. In other words, he's on assignment and doesn't even know it. How many know you are on assignment and you don't even know it? You could have an assignment right here that was not your intention, but it was God's intention, amen? And God will speak to you and tell you to do something you had no idea. That was why your whole purpose for being in a place. Amen? And so what we find out is that Philip um, comes in contact with an Ethiopian man. Amen? He's an Enoch. He is <clears throat> one who is in a high office of the treasury for the Ethiopian queen. And he's in his chariot. And as he's in his chariot, and he comes in contact with Philip. He's reading a scripture, a passage from Isaiah. 
And as he's reading this passage, he asks Isaiah, what does this mean? What is this all about? Who is this person that they're talking about in this passage? And the film begins to say, oh, they, they, this is talking about Jesus Christ. This is kind of talking about the Messiah. There, this is the passage talking about how he's going to be the ransom, how he's going to die for the world, and how you're going to have eternal life. And so as he was opening up the scriptures and telling him about it and telling him that he needed to be saved and he needed to be baptized, it says that the Ethiopian man, the Enoch, when he heard this, he confessed. He said, well, he said to him, what is it that prevents me from being baptized right now? Right now. Is there a hindrance? Is there something that can prevent me from being baptized right now? And Philip replied and said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And then the Ethiopian man made a confession out of his own mouth. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And right then, when he made that confession, it says they commanded the chariot to be stopped. Because you see, the Enoch already had his eye on a body of water. And so, once he made that confession, they got out, and right there, and right then, Philip took him in the water. Amen. Emerged him. Amen. He came up new. Amen. It was a symbol that he had believed. Amen. And he was baptized right then. You might ask, well, who is it that should be baptized? Well, a familiar scripture, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Amen? Let's take a look at it together. It's a very familiar scripture, amen? But we don't want to take it lightly. We want to make sure that we understand it, amen? And it reads as follows. This is who should be baptized. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, if you confess with your own mouth, the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. In other words, you've got to say it out your own mouth. Amen. You got to believe it in your own heart. And you got to believe not only that he died and rose again. Amen. From the dead. But you got to believe that God raised him up. Amen. And then you shall be saved. It says, for with the heart, verse 10, man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made. Amen. So, <clears throat> as we look at this, we see that. Um, <clears throat> that if you believe that you should be baptized, amen, and that you are saved, and so then you have to show that by a public acknowledgement, amen. Now, there are times the thief on the cross and a lot of people who accept Jesus Christ on their deathbed never get a chance to make it to the water, but nevertheless, they are saved. Why are they saved? Because the, the baptism comes after you are already saved. And so we do it in obedience to God's command. We get baptized. But for those who receive Jesus Christ on their deathbed with their last breath and sincerely confess that they are a sinner, they sincerely repent of their ways. The belief is on the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, that he is the Savior, God has raised him from the dead, then they are saved, amen. amen. We know that Jesus told the thief on the cross, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, in paradise. That's right, that's right. amen. So now we're going to review the questions that are often asked about baptism. And hopefully now you have the answer. Should a baby be baptized? The answer is... No. No. Why? Because can a baby confess with their mouth no. the Lord Jesus? Can a baby um, believe in their heart that Jesus, God raised him from the dead? No. no. So the answer to that is no. Can you get baptized more than once? Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Some people get more, some people get baptized more than once, particularly because when they got baptized, they did not believe in their heart. They did not confess with their mouth. It was not their own choice. It was the choice of their parent, their grandparent, church officials, or somebody else. But baptism and salvation have to be a personal choice. In other words, you need to know what you're doing. This is a decision and a choice and an understanding that you have come to for yourself. Amen. Amen. So a lot of times when people uh, haven't done that, that wasn't their experience. They really didn't know what I was doing. If it, it really had no meaning, you just went in the water. You could have just went on swimming. Amen? Amen. Because you weren't saved then because you didn't believe then because you didn't confess then. Amen? It says... Why should believers be, uh, then it says, do you have to be baptized to be saved? The answer is, no, no. no because no. you get saved first. You're already saved when you get baptized, amen? But once you get uh, saved, you should get baptized, amen? Why should believers be baptized? Because it's one of the ordinances who instituted Jesus, amen, and he commanded, and he set the example for us, amen, and he did it himself, amen, and that the scripture might be fulfilled, amen. The next question you might ask is, well, why did Jesus get baptized since he didn't sin? To fulfill the scriptures, amen, we amen. said he did that. To set the example, we said he did that. And because this was the thing, he was about to take on the sins of the world. Right. Even though he knew no sin, he was about to take on the sins of the world. The question asked too is, how old do you have to be to be baptized? There's not <clears throat> Some, and I'm glad you said that, Brother Mike, because some people under doctrine believe that you have to be 12. But what does the scripture tell us? When you can what? Confess That's out right. your own mouth the believe Lord Jesus the, and believe, believe in, in your heart, heart Amen. that God raised him from the dead, then you are saved. And once you're saved, you have a right, amen, and a responsibility to be baptized. So there's some children who come to the understanding at six. There's some grown-ups who don't come to the understanding until 86. So wherever it is, when you grasp the knowledge and receive who Jesus is, believe in your heart, that makes you a ready candidate. Amen? Amen. 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 Now we're going to go to the a Holy Communion or the Last Supper. Amen? Amen. Because again, this is something that we need to be knowledgeable of and not to do in ignorance because it has great consequences. You have your hand up? Okay. Amen. And I'm glad she asked the question. What it, she was saying to the child is 10 or 12. Is that true or not? Here is the answer according to the scripture. The thing about it is, <clears throat> as parents, what we do is we have a responsibility to raise our children, to teach them right from wrong. The moment a child realizes that they are doing something wrong and that it is a sin, then the moment they become aware, it's on them. Amen. It's on them. Amen. So it's not when you get 12. It's not when you get 10. It's the moment that you realize that, you're doing that wrong. what you are doing is wrong and you do it anyway. Amen. Amen. If you didn't understand what you were doing back then, yeah, but you don't understand. Uh huh. And so you are saved now, 
but your baptism will represent the fact that you really are saved. You're still saved, but your, this is your public display when you go down in the water Amen. to declare to the world that I have made my decision to be saved. Let me say this as well. A lot of people came up with the 12 years old because it said when Jesus was 12, is when he left and went into the, the temple. temple. That's right. And he had an understanding of the word. Well, Jesus had an understanding of 12 because he is the word made flesh. But there's a lot of 12 year olds who don't have that understanding. Amen? And there are a lot of grown folks who don't have that understanding. So what they did is they took it out of context. But a child, children, hear me. The moment that you know that you're doing something wrong. You have sinned and you need to tell God you're sorry. Don't expect mom and daddy to do it till you get 12. No. no. You must do it. Amen. Yeah. You must do it. Amen. And now as we look at the Holy Communion, which is also known as the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper, we'll find that this was instituted by Jesus Christ himself during the Passover. Amen. We know that the uh, Israelites celebrated the Passover, which represented their celebration and their thanksgiving unto God for allowing them to be able to be passed over when the plague came in Egypt. And they said, if you put the blood of the lamb on the post, on the mantle, then when the death angel comes and it sees the blood, it will pass over. It won't come to your house. Somebody say, it won't come to my house. It'll keep moving. And so when they did that, they found out that in obedience that everybody else's firstborn son died. But those Israelites who were obedient, that didn't happen. Their firstborn was speared. And what happened is you could hear the wailing and the crying all through the street. Amen? Because Mothers and fathers were realizing that their oldest son was dead. And God gave the Israelites safe passage out of Egypt. But he told them, remember this day. Don't ever forget it. Remember how I speared you. Remember how I saved you. Remember how I brought you out. And he said, not only do I want you to remember, but tell your children. Don't ever let them forget. Don't let your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. This must be passed down from generation to generation. And so even when Jesus was born into the flesh, amen, and came into the world, it was something he still took poor part of. But what he taught them to do is to take a look back and yet take a look forward. Because it wasn't going to end right there. Amen? And so we find out that Jesus used the same sacraments, amen, that they had used for the Passover in the upper room. Amen? Turn with me, if you will, now to Matthew, the 26th chapter, verses 26 through 30. Matthew, the 26th chapter, verses 26 through 30. Amen. And we will find these words. And as they were eating, this is disciples, amen, in the upper room with Jesus. Jesus took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until the day when I drink it in 
new with you in my Father's kingdom. Again, he said, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Amen? And so we see in this passage, amen, that Jesus, amen, has the sacraments. This would be Jesus' last meal with his disciples before his crucifixion. Just as the Passover was celebrated for the Israel's deliverance from slavery in Egypt, the Lord's Supper is a celebration of our deliverance from slavery through sin, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we find that we use these sacraments. As we look at the table, and everything always sits on the communion table, the communion table represents a place of fellowship, a place of sharing, and the central place of communing. Amen? So you see that we're gathered around the table. Then as we look at the sacraments, before anybody receives it, the first thing is, for each one, thanks is being given. Amen? Amen. So as we look here, we see who gave the uh, Last Supper. It was Jesus himself. He was demonstrating to them what had to be done. Amen? And so we find out that he took the, this is the wine that represents the fruit of the vine. This is the bread that represents Jesus' body. And so what we find is what he did is before he ever touched the bread, he gave God thanks. He gave God thanks. Amen. And we need to, before we even take anything from the communion table, mm -hmm. we need to give God thanks. We need to give him thanks. And then the scripture tells us that after that, he took the bread. And Reverend Cooper, will help me, please? It's good to have a big brother. Amen. So he says he took, uh, the scripture tells us that Jesus took the bread, amen, and after giving thanks, he broke it, amen. amen. And then he told them what it represented, amen. amen. He said, this is my body. That's right, come on. Which has been broken for you. Mm -hmm. We know the scripture lets us know that none of his bones were broken. That's right. But his body was. What do I mean? There was a separation. There was a bruising. There was a tearing away, amen, at his body for us on Calvary's cross. If we look at Isaiah, the, uh, turn with me 53 and 5, you'll see that the scripture says this. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Yeah. And he was bruised for our iniquities. Mm -hmm. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Amen. And so he's letting them know that what his body was about to go through was for us. Amen. And he's letting them know, letting them know that his body would be broken. The scripture lets us know that he was unrecognizable when they got finished with him. Amen? And then he told them to take it, as he told them it was for, and he said, take and he said Amen? Amen. He said, take it and eat it. Amen? So Lord, we thank you, because I'm not going to let it go to waste. Amen? Amen? Lord, we thank you, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, for the bread Amen. that was broken, God. For us, so oh God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your body. For me, God. Amen. In Jesus' name. Then he told me to take and eat it. Amen. And the scripture says, then after he did that, 
Amen. I got to get back to my place. Then he took the cup. Amen. And it says that he took the cup, which is the fruit of the vine, and he blessed it. Amen. And after uh, blessing it, he, uh, he gave thanks for it. He said, Lord, I thank you. Amen. Isn't it somehow Jesus is giving thanks? And yet he's the one that's going to suffer. Amen. But he's thanking God, amen, for it. So he takes the fruit of the vine and he gives thanks for it. Then he tell, takes it to the disciples. He said, drink. And then he said, drink all of it. Uh -huh. <laughs> amen. He said, drink all of this because this represents my blood. Amen. The New Testament. Yeah. Amen. That is... Uh, in my blood that is what? Shed for you for the remission of your sins. Amen? Amen. So we thank God So we need to be remembering what all this goes to. We say that the remission of sins, we have to remember every drop of blood. Oh, he said drink all of it because everything I did, all of my blood was for the remission of your sins. So when we think about it, we think of how they took him from judgment hall to judgment hall. How they beat him even before he got on Calvary's cross. Then we think about how they took the thorns and how the thorns they took and they um, stuck it down, amen, into mm -hmm. his skull, amen? amen. And we know there was some bleeding. We know that they took the spikes and put them through his, his hands. The spikes were long enough that they would go through his hands the palm of his hand 